It's the toughest uh, uh, job, actually, to moderate the um, two so cool uh, people that I'm soon going to invite to the stage to moderate the last panel of uh, um, events that is uh, full of uh, crazy ideas and uh, crazy talks, but uh, let's kick things off. So we'll go from IPOs to the ICOs. So first, John uh, from uh, Toronto uh, Stock Exchange, come and join us uh, on uh, the stage. You're going to be the IPO guy uh, tonight. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> so uh, you're going to present what? The past? Right. Great, thanks. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm going to be the present, and here's the future ICOs, CoinList, Joshua. Let's see. Okay. Um, so uh, we agree, uh, agreed it in a way that uh, Joshua will uh, first uh, run you through the, the ICOs, the CoinList, the token offering, and uh, then we're going to discuss about it, what the future is going to bring us. All right, can you hear me? How's everybody doing? Hanging in there? I mean, you've been here all day long. I can't imagine. I just flew from uh, California yesterday, and I'm about to die right now. It's but, 6.30 uh, his time, Yeah. a.m. Well, not only <laughs> am I in the middle of the night, but I don't, if you guys are crypto investors, I don't know if you've seen what's been going on with crypto uh, in the past few days, but it's not good news. So I'm just sad up here talking to you about what's going on. But I have a presentation. Let's go through it really quickly. I'm going to give a, um, a short intro on uh, ICOs, uh, kind of how this whole fad started and what we see happening next in uh, cryptocurrencies. And let's keep it short, so let's get right into it. Now, I was told that this green button makes this thing go forward one. There we go. So I think that, to be honest, everybody that's gotten into cryptocurrency probably got into it uh, for one reason, and that's because somebody, either you got rich or one of your friends got rich off of it, and you got very interested. What is this thing, Bitcoin? What is blockchain? Um, and there's been a lot of fear that maybe that wealth creation was in the past with the first adopters of Ethereum or with Bitcoin. But actually, we're still seeing up to this very day that ICOs are happening and that tokens are increasing in value and that people are still uh, generating a lot of wealth off of this. So I actually have a story from uh, last week. My friend asked for some Ethereum to invest in an ICO. And I thought, oh, this is going to be some kind of like chunky ICO. Um, but she's my good friend. So I said, here's some Ethereum. And uh, please pay it back to me next week after you've, uh, after you've uh, bought your own Ethereum. So I got my Ethereum back from my friend, and I asked her, how did it go? And she said, well, I actually made 10 times my money in the, in the, in the span of two weeks off of this ICO, which is unbelievable. Do, do you guys, does anyone know Holochain? Anybody? Yeah. So this was the Holochain ICO that just happened, and she turned her money around. Well, my money around, but actually I didn't get anything out of that, which was a really bad deal on my part, by the way. But uh, we're, we're still seeing uh, all kinds of uh, insane wealth being created out of these ICOs, which I think is why a lot of the craze exists around uh, crypto and ICOs. And investors like this, especially coming from a traditional um, seed stage or angel or VC, you're looking at being locked up in your money for five to 10 years. And then you don't even know if you're going to have a chance at a liquidity event. You know, you have to have one of the lucky companies that gets acquired or maybe goes public. Uh, the great thing about crypto that investors love is that it's liquid immediately, and last year we saw maybe in the history of uh, global finance one of the most insane rallies that ever happened. Uh, obviously at the top here, uh, XRP, which is Ripple's coin, uh, returned something like 360x. Uh, that's, that's a whole other conversation. Why, why is Ripple so valuable? I don't know if anyone knows that. But uh, you can say that about a lot of the coins up here. So there's a lot of excitement around crypto, and investors uh, love this, this quick time frame and the liquidity involved with crypto. And for founders, they love it too. And we know something about this because for eight years at Angelus, we were helping companies get access to a more diverse and larger pool of capital uh, by building a marketplace online for entrepreneurs to sell their seed stage uh, offerings to investors uh, around the US and, and then after that around the world. So in eight years of work at Angelist, we managed to move $800 million into uh, seed stage companies. 
Now, pretty impressive. We felt pretty good about that, but we had a lot of hurdles. Um, it turns out that mom and dad don't really want to take their very small amount of savings and put it into a company where they may, where they have a 95% chance of never getting anything back for the next five or 10 years. Um, so really only sophisticated investors wanted to take part in these deals. And crowdfunding, at least the way it went down in the US, kind of flopped. Now I know crowdfunding's actually worked out pretty well in the EU, and uh, I think that's because you had better regulations and legislation passed around it. But in the US, it didn't work so well. And also raising online, if you were raising money online, it was kind of a negative signal. It was like almost like being caught on a dating app. Like you didn't want to be caught uh, soliciting yourself on the internet trying to raise money for your company. It was uh, embarrassing for startups to be found uh, putting their, their listings up on AngelList. We had to fight that perception. But then the whole ICO thing happened. And pretty much overnight in six months, we managed to do half of the capital that was raised on AngelList um, in six months of operating CoinList and running ICOs on CoinList. So founders love this very fast uh, access to, to all this capital that exists in the crypto markets. And this is a really great visualization. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but uh, if you Google, um, I couldn't get the video working because apparently I don't know how to make slides, but there's a great visualization over time about how the ICO market has exploded. And I think it's estimated that now 10 to $12 billion has been invested into companies via ICOs. So for founders, it makes a lot of sense. And a typical equity fundraise, you're giving up ownership of your company. And because you're giving up ownership of your company, you're also giving up control. Investors may take board seats. Um, they may get preferred stock versus what some of the other employees and founders may have. And then, of course, it's just a huge hassle to do all the offline paperwork involved with uh, running a traditional equity fundraising. Now, if you're running a protocol or a network and you print tokens to raise money for your company, then clearly you're not going to deal with any of this. You're going to uh, have complete control over your company um, in terms of ownership, in terms of voting, um, as well as you have all these tools available to you and during your fundraise, like you can dynamically price your fundraise. So typically in, a, in the old school way, you set your terms with the lead investor and then if you find that over time there's more demand for uh, your round, you're not really able to move the price that much. Uh, but that's not so with tokens. You can easily move your price as demand rises during an ICO. Um, also, you can raise money in just a ridiculous amount of time. So we ran the Filecoin ICO on CoinList, and in two hours we had $200 million raised uh, through this ICO, which is beyond anything we'd ever seen before. For investors, of course, this all makes sense. We, we talked about this. Um, you're not locked up for five to 10 years. Um, you don't have to wait for this liquidity event where there's an acquisition or it gets listed publicly. You're capable to take you pretty much get your tokens instantly. You can sell them tomorrow, you can sell them next week, you can sell them in a month or a year. It's just like buying stocks in the stock market. Uh, but unlike stocks, you can withdraw uh, these tokens and move them to any exchange you want to. And these days, there are hundreds of exchanges where you can trade these. So there's a lot of money getting pushed in here, but what, what value is being created? Well, if you look at the top, the great thing about blockchains is that it's all public. So we can see what are the top dApps that are running on the Ethereum blockchain. Now, a dApp is a distributed app for, for anyone that's not super uh, into the whole lingo of, of, uh, of uh, Ethereum and blockchain. So the top 10 apps, if you look at what's running on Ethereum right now by daily activity, you can see that the first three are exchanges, which uh, it's really kind of questionable how much value that is. That's basically just investors swapping their virtual tokens with each other. And then the rest are games such as uh, Shrimp Farm, Crypto Kitties. I don't know if anyone's played Shrimp Farm or Crypto Kitties, but apparently this is uh, what, what our uh, wonderful invention is being used for right now. So it's easy to look at this and kind of be, um, or just look at the whole cryptocurrency world in general and, and kind of ask, where's the actual value being created here? Uh, what, what is all this investment being used for? So if you want to talk about that, you have to zoom out and think about, there are three types of crypto when you talk about crypto. First, you have the, the basic idea of cryptocurrency, the original idea, which is Bitcoin, or something that is uh, created natively in a blockchain that is the economic uh, incentive for that blockchain to operate. So in Ethereum, that's Ether, which allows people around the world to share their compute power with each other. 
in Filecoin, which is a big ICO that we did, that's storage space on your computer. So you, sell, you put storage space on the blockchain and you get Filecoin back. The next category and the majority of ICOs that you see are utility tokens. So utility tokens are a second layer. They're not actually a native blockchain. It's, it's a smart contract that exists on a blockchain. And this contract basically says, OK, there are 10 million tokens that exist, and a certain number of people own this, 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 and this. And it's a database that's shared around the world that uh, everybody has access to. These are the so-called uh, Ethereum tokens. And most, if you, if you go look at a listing like on CoinMarketCap, I would say 90% of what you see there are uh, utility tokens or Ethereum tokens. And then finally, the sort of new thing that is uh, up and coming that I think is going to be uh, really big in 2018 and next year are security tokens. So security tokens operate like utility tokens, but on the, uh, they're, not, they're not part of a virtual network. They're not used in a virtual economy. Security tokens actually represent something in the real world. So uh, typically, that would be start equity in a company. It might be equity in a fund. It might be real estate. So you can take these uh, securities that exist in the real world and now map them onto a, a smart contract and generate tokens and have them be extremely liquid on a blockchain. So why would you want to tokenize? I mean, it makes a ton of sense. You, there's no more management of your cap table and ownership. Uh, it's simply looking at who owns what in the token pool. And then because of that, you can do some really cool things. I'm sure we'll talk about DAOs here in a little bit. But you can operate the governance of your company based on who owns how many tokens, and they can vote with those tokens. Uh, it opens up a lot of really cool opportunities. You also have instant liquidity. So anybody that's ever worked at a startup knows the pain of the number one problem you have of, well, I get rich on paper, but when am I ever going to see cash out of this? Possibly never, right? So imagine a world where you can take that equity that you have in your startup and make it liquid whenever you choose to. Uh, I think anybody that's ever worked at a startup is salivating at the idea of being able to actually cash out these things that they've been uh, paid in all this time that may not actually ever realize any value. And then finally, you have a worldwide pool of buyers and sellers. So anybody that knows how to operate a crypto wallet or an Ethereum wallet <coughs> excuse me, can uh, invest and buy uh, equity in your company or real estate that you're selling or anything like that. But there's a real question about what are, are, what, which tokens are securities and which aren't. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, do I look like I'm dying up here? <laughs> I think I need an IV next time, thanks. So um, Jay Clayton, who is the lead regulator of securities in the United States, recently said a few months ago in a hearing that all of the ICOs that he's seen so far have been securities offerings, which basically overnight killed the ICO market in the United States. And we've seen this in other countries as well. So China has clamped down on ICOs. Uh, South Korea has as well. And um, almost overnight at CoinList, we saw that the companies that, or the issuers that we were helping do compliance for their ICOs started blocking um, investors from these countries because of the unclear regulatory status, which is a huge, um, a huge advantage you have in Europe is that there, there are some countries that have been really great about this, like Switzerland probably has some of the most pro-ICO um, regulation and legislation out there and guidance on that. And I know in Estonia, it's kind of up in the air, but the government seems to be pretty friendly about figuring it out. So some things to think about are the ICO market is definitely hotter than ever, but is crypto here to stay? You know, a lot of people tie price to um, the success of cryptocurrencies. And as we see the price go up and down, we have people talking about things being bubbles um, and with, with very little value actually being created so far out of blockchain in terms of uh, usage of blockchain outside of money, you know, how, how are we going to justify uh, whether this is going to be sticking around for the next five or ten years? Now, most ICOs operate like private deals. So the Telegram ICO, which is probably going to go down as the biggest ICO in history, I think they're raising $1.8 billion, was actually not a public ICO, which was the whole point of this in the first place, is that everyone in the world should be able to invest no matter what your status as an accredited investor, uh, whether you're in a certain jurisdiction or not. The idea behind crypto originally is that everyone should have access to everything. And now we're just seeing 
ICOs go back to this system that uh, we were previously using for, for private fundraising. 95% of ICOs, you could probably easily say, are junk. They have no product, they're low quality, they're just outright frauds. And um, it's unclear that that even has any effect on the price because a lot of these coins still trade at very high values even though there's no product or no proof that there's going to be value behind the uh, coin or token. So there's a real question here, is this just a casino or is this actual, actually an investment? And as I said, Europe has a chance to lead here with taxation and regulation and we're probably going to see in 2018 that this idea of security tokens, taking things that in the offline world and mapping them to tokens is going to be a huge, um, is, is going to be the next huge step in blockchain and uh, finance on the blockchain. So those are, that's pretty much everything I have here. I'm going to sit down and chug this water and then uh, <laughs> let's have a discussion. Thanks. <clears throat> So the, um, the whole thing that, uh, around the ICOs is actually to get cheaper capital for the growth, right? Mm -hmm. Is it the growth of the project or uh, growth of the company, growth of something for uh, many people? And the upside of it is that the investment becomes tradable, right? Which has been the role of the stock, ex uh, stock exchanges for the last 100 years. Yeah. So. Uh, John, this is the challenge for you and for your in mm. industry. Um, and uh, I know we had very many discussions around it, and, and this is actually one of the smartest uh, guys working on, on the uh, global uh, stock exchanges. So what are you going to do about it? You, you saw those numbers, 400 million, um, and uh, then 1.8. I mean, how long has it been up? The uh, uh, te um, Telegram uh, ICO was... One I think month? they've been forming that for about six to eight months. Yeah, but I mean, but they offer? It's very unclear because, as I said, it's being done as a private deal yeah. now, so, so yeah. the details just come out in leaks. How can you compete? That, that, that's actually a really, really good question. I, I mean, the, the, the first thing that I would say, um, I'm not that old, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, but I do work for an organization that is old. I mean, the, uh, the, the stock exchange in Canada is, uh, is about 150 some odd years old. It's, it's actually older than the country itself. Um, the elements of, of the stock exchange, we have uh, the senior board, the venture board, we have a derivatives exchange, our clearing houses. All of this has evolved over the last you know, century. And the system itself absolutely is, is, is complex. Uh, you know, did it grow that way uh, deliberately? Probably not, but a lot of the things, especially around compliance regulation, how you protect the investor, how you protect you know, the, the retail community to actually go and trade these things that are somewhat legitimate. And if you actually look at Joshua's um, you know, overview, it is very clear why you know, the, you know, exponential scan or deployment of this isn't fully adopted just yet because the regulatory guidance isn't 100% there. Uh, you know, the facts are clear that yes, if, if it is 95% of these things are, are junk, that's, that's not exactly a statistic that, you know, someone like an exchange with a listed issuer process on onboarding validation that it is legitimate, et cetera, uh, would tolerate. And our regulators definitely would not tolerate that as well. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting challenge. Uh, when we originally looked at this, we started exploring the viability of, of how blockchain could actually transform the exchange business in 2015. And if you look at the TMX group in 2015 to where it is now, it actually is a different company, even though we haven't actually gone right into uh, the ICO framework because we realized that it's not something that we can do alone. It's actually an ecosystem that needs to move. And some of these things are, it, it, it's very apparent that obviously the business process flows that exist today, um, there's a tremendous amount of efficiencies that can theoretically come out of this, which means that some of the intermediaries or, or actors within the existing ecosystem, you, you kind of wouldn't need them anymore. Um, but it's an interesting problem because you need them to help transform and pivot. You need the overall adoption to, to go and move that over. And so it takes a very forward looking uh, individual to actually say, yeah, I'm working myself out of a job. And that's just 
you know, human nature to, to not necessarily go in and jump and do that. Uh, but we've done a lot of things to explore the underpinning technology with, with blockchain. We've, we've kind of parked the crypto discussion because that is a deployment of the underpinning technology uh, for the simple reason that if we ta tried to tackle that first, uh, we would not get very far because the regulatory environment in Canada is not 100% clear on, on even what this is. Just, just the sheer classification of it, with the exception of Bitcoin and Ethereum, just hammer drop saying, you know, right now we're just going to view everything as a security, whether it's a utility or asset backed or not, we're just going to regulate as if it was. And the good news is that our regulators are realizing that pro that was probably a knee-jerk reaction in the wrong direction. And so they're trying to figure out how do you taper it back uh, so that you can kind of help foster the innovation piece. Um, but it's not a tricky road. I mean, it's, it's obviously something you can't do in a, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so uh, you've, both of you quite often mentioned the regulators, right? So yes. either the regulators helping the business or they are not uh, helping the business. The way the uh, uh, raising the capital and trading the capital is regulated right now, it's actually regulated through the institutions provided some kind of uh, service, right? There's a stock market providing the trading and the information system, and then the brokerage who help you to uh, um, uh, pass on the transactions and all of those things. And all of a sudden, we have the coin list, who is just the coin list. You don't have no brokers, any brokers. You don't have any post trade. So, and, and you are successful, right? So actually, those two uh, organizations, one is full of the um, intermediaries providing the trust, they were regulated, then there's the young organization, and uh, is, is this what we're gonna see, is that the um, investors are uh, transforming to trust and don't trust the institutions anymore, but form to more trust the technology. I mean, I think it'll be a spectrum based on people's understanding of the technology and also the risk tolerance. So someone that wants to make a safer bet will, of course, stay with uh, existing institutions and regulations and things like that. And I wouldn't even say that CoinList is at the uh, bleeding edge of what's going on with crypto fundraising. I mean, there are some... Uh, ICOs that happen entirely on the Ethereum yeah. blockchain, and it's just yeah, a smart contract. It. So there's no so organization you're involved. You're part of centralized uh, system. We right? are a bit centralized. You yeah. are. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're working in a in a space where soon we expect ourselves to be dinosaurs in like three years. So it's kind of a weird place to be. So are you going to wear a suit too then? Then, then, then we're <laughs> going to ask about you naming you the past. But no, this will be the suit of the future. I think <laughs> yeah. actually, yeah. yeah. Um, but there there also are attempts to move the regulatory aspect onto the blockchain. So um, the, there are many companies working on this, in, in the US at least, where you do your the sort of things you have to do in a typical uh, fundraising process, like KYC, know your customer, money laundering checks, accreditation checks. That will all be done by holding a token that says that uh, you've already done those checks, and then once you have that token and that contract, you can interact with other contracts that want to be compliant from a regulatory perspective. But uh, I mean, let's let's go crazy and let's go uh, into the uh, into the let's say five years time, right? When you're going to be dinosaur? Do you think that the it's the future is that? Uh, there's going to be no exchanges, so the technology is trading the tokens. Mm -hmm. Somebody's holding the assets uh, in the wallet. Wallet has some kind of a code. Code is uh, trading the tokens. There's yeah. going to be no coin list. There's going to be no yeah. uh, TMX. So, so I, I think in, in, in five years, um, the need for a central institution will probably still be there because there are some functions that an exchange does that I don't think a, a blockchain can actually solve for right now. Uh, do I think that the current operating model of an exchange uh, will be the exact same in five years? Absolutely not. I, I, I don't think so. And if you think about the services of, of what an exchange does, maybe we'll take a quick step back and, and talk about what does the, the old incumbent the exchange or, or the ecosystem actually do to protect the investor, to help foster liquidity, et cetera. 
if you think about our listed, ser you know, our listed issuer services and, and how you actually get onboarded onto an exchange, they are speculative investments. There's a degree of risk tied to it, but there is some due diligence. There is reporting obligations to validate that these things are, are real. Now, 100% of ventures are not necessarily successful, uh, but there's that risk and disclosure statements right up front that that is the case, and you are accepting those terms and risks. Then they'll come back and actually ask you, are you sure? And then they'll ask you again, are you sure? And then they'll go and facilitate and do the trade. So there are some inherent processes on that front. Now, an exchange will actually go and trade equity. So once these things are actually done and you've IPO'd or, or issued a token, you create a venue to actually trade those, so to get in and out of those positions. This is where an exchange will actually provide liquidity and the sources of liquidity. If you go into a decentralized universe, sourcing that liquidity may be a little bit different. I don't think they've kind of figured it out. If you think about price discovery, the concentration to go to a marketplace where volume is there, you'll, you'll probably get a better price for, for the value of the security that you have. That's how an exchange has evolved. Now, when you go and do that, there's a tremendous amount of disclosure on the validation of that transaction. So market data and, and the feeds that come out so that the world knows that these trades have happened across these institutions, et cetera, to kind of gauge how liquid some of these things are. And then, of course, you've got all your reporting to talk about how much revenue has come in, what products have come in. You can look at that as speculative values. All of these things are within the existing construct. The clearing and settlement cycles of that is really looking at how you take that security asset and then the currency or the payment mechanism and actually ensure that that transaction yeah. takes place. This but is the existing world today. But if you look at the new world and, and how this comes in, a lot of these functions become automated. A lot of these functions in terms of how you go and validate, you know, you, you probably don't need to have, uh, you know, the exact same services that, mm -hmm. that an exchange would have today. But I think that yeah. they would fundamentally change, yeah. uh, not to the point where you would not need them at all. But, but it's, it's uh, not just the way they're going to be traded, but you mentioned the three types of the tokens, the utility one, the protocol one, and the security one. And if you think about it, then uh, very many tokens, and in the future what we see, will be issued by the organization that at the present legal terms just don't exist like uh, the DAO case was, but it's, it's not, let's not go into the case, but uh, the uh, decentralized autonomous organization, which is just an agreement with a bunch of uh, people, agreement written in the code that we're going to do something. There's no private limited company, there's no equity, there's nothing. So the value will be sometimes created on the protocol level, sometimes on this kind of utility level, and only something on the equity level. So the reporting mechanism uh, should uh, change. What will be those reports? Who is actually the organization you're talking to? And, and this is the challenge. So how are you uh, facing those challenges? The different organizations that are going to start raising the funds, which we don't see as an organization in the, in the present. I mean, they, they won't be similar to organizations as we know organizations. Yeah. I mean, yeah. DAO and saying distributed autonomous organization, I almost kind of hate that terminology because it's so opaque and hard to understand. It's just a group of people that have voting shares in uh, a contract that is forced by nature because it's code, it's not human, and uh, they get to cast their votes uh, using however much ownership they have in this uh, community. So. I, I certainly think that DAOs are, are, it's, you know, there are so many things on the bleeding edge of, of blockchain, and I think yeah. that the DAOs are, are definitely operating in that space. And it's really too bad that, you know, the first big DAO that came out, which was the, um, the, the Ethereum one that mm -hmm. had, you know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because these things are code, if there's a bug in the code, <laughs> then the organization falls apart. So there was a bug in the code for the first DAO that let a, a thief come in and steal all the money, basically. Uh, in fact, this was a highly, anybody that's into Ethereum knows this was a highly contentious argument within Ethereum, and they decided to actually fork or change the entire Ethereum network to go back in time and fix the bug um, mm -hmm. in that 
so basically they were acting as judges, which is what we were trying to replace with the whole, uh, <laughs> with the whole process yeah. of creating uh, smart contracts and having blockchains. So uh, that, that's, that's another total unknown that we, in five to 10 years, I think we'll have some clarity on. But are, are we going to continue to see these, these community developers mm -hmm. act as the new judges in the system? The coders are the new judges. They get to say, oh, we made a mistake in the contract. The DAO isn't functioning correctly, and now we're going to go back in time and, and change the code, and therefore they become the judges of the new yeah. system. Which means it gives a challenge to every single founder is to think about actually what do you want to fund? Is it this organization, the network of something, some bunch of friends? Is it some kind of a project? Is it the technology and the protocol layer, or is it some kind of a equity? But more importantly, it challenges the investors to understand where the value will be created. So uh, what do you think is the, uh, is the uh, implications, I mean, for the investor network around you with this new way of thinking? And will the equity be the only, I mean, the security on the bond funds? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you think about the, the types of asset classes that can be traded today, th this could be viewed as, as another one. Um, but a lot of the things that exist within the existing construct are, are kind of being recreated. Just even that DAO example, for example, where you've got the majority voting rights. I mean, th that's kind of what happens at an annual general meeting when you're actually going in and voting on executive compensation, voting on who the, uh, the finance auditor is going to be. Like, you actually have that right to dictate the strategic direction of, of the company as a result of the share ownership that you have. And I think this is just another mechanism in, 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 in how you can do that. So I think there's a lot of parallels in, in, in how this is moving together. And the one thing that, you know, when I look at how the, the construct is, is moving forward, um, I think it's still very, very nascent, but it's very, very clear that the value um, and the robustness of, of this ecosystem and how it's going to expand is, is going at a pace that you've never seen previously in, in, in the last 50, 100 years. I mean, even if you think about the advent of electronic trading and how an exchange evolved from the really old school days where there was a, you know, an open trading floor and people are yelling back and forth to actually go and do a trade. And, and back then they go, oh my God, I did 100 trades. That was awesome, right? And if you think about where we are now, it's 100,000 and, and there's only one person versus 200, right? This is just the next evolution of that. And, and I think that when you, when you try to wrap around you know, how to actually sustain a market and, and bring robustness to it, it's not one entity that can do that. It's, it's, it's a collection of actors within the ecosystem all moving forward together in some unified fashion. And I think even if you look at examples like the DAO, that's what they're doing. They're actually going in and mobilizing that. And when you think about the traditional incumbents, the broker-dealer networks, the, the banks, you know, the central banks and the authorities, the, the regulatory bodies, all of them realize that th there is something here that could be the tipping point of moving to another technical revolution. And, and of course, all of this is really powered by just cheaper and cheaper computing power. Uh, but it gets to the point where they realize that you need to really go and experiment and explore how your operating model can adapt and evolve. Because if you don't, you really will become like a dinosaur. You, you, you know, the value and services that you have, uh, it will just erode. It'll, it'll just continue to go down as the rest of the world will start to pivot and move forward into this new, more effective and efficient uh, you know, trading model. It's uh, pretty interesting if we look from the past and, and try to predict the future, then the financial sector service and the financial services are very much provided by uh, different big names and bif bif different institutions. All of them um, uh, actually go into the clients and saying, you can trust us. And then the Lehman Brothers started something 2007, which resulted in all of us suffering, actually, mm -hmm. who we are in the financial sector. Can't open the international bank account, can't trade, can't do this. So how can you actually, and, and the new system, avoid this kind of Lehman Brothers around you? Because everything what we see, I mean, uh, blockchain is just an enabler, right? Mm -hmm. to, to make and change something. 
How can you avoid these things? Well, when we talk about decentralizing things, we have to make sure that we're actually enforcing the decentralization of it. So um, there are, there have been aspects in the past 10 years in the, you know, in the short history of crypto where there have been actors that have cropped up that have been too big and they've brought the ecosystem down when they failed. So like when Mt. Gox, you know, uh, anybody that was into crypto in 2013 may remember that we had this year where, where it was exploding and Bitcoin was at $10, I think, at the beginning of the year. And then by the end of the year, it was 1000 And who knows what would have happened that year except Mt. Gox, which was basically the only place where you could trade crypto for uh, fiat, as we call it, or you know, your, your own native currency. Um, Mt. Gox was hacked and lost tons of customer deposits. And... Um, uh, that was an example of uh, everyone was a little too excited and the infrastructure wasn't there yet. And so we had this awesome decentralized uh, product and technology that we were interested in. But then only one player came in to, to play this certain part. And now, you know, a great advancement we've made is, and by we, I just mean, I, I certainly am not making these advancements, but everyone in crypto that's working on this stuff are decentralized exchanges. So... Uh, again, we've replaced Mt. Gox now with a smart contract. So you deposit your money into a smart contract, you put your orders in the order book in the smart contract, and the contract knows how to match buyers and sellers. And uh, we run less of a risk. Now the risk we run is, is the code robust in the contract? Are we going to have another DAO situation where the contract is hacked? But, um, but, but the, this, this has been, as, as you were saying, like a, in, probably the most explosive um, spread of technology in history. So it's gotten ahead of itself quite a few times. Um, and, and a lot of work needs to be done to make sure that all of the decentralized infrastructure is there before it moves forward too quickly. Um, do you both believe that in 2028, there's going to be blockchain? In Still live, 20, existing, 2028? 20, 20, oh, uh, I would say absolutely yes. You say yes? Uh, in, in production, on an enterprise scale, uh, out there, yes, I, I firmly believe that. I actually think it might be sooner, that 2028, that's 10 years out. So yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a little far out, actually, the in my mind. The question is, is it still alive? Is uh, it still there? I would say it, it, would, it would probably, e even if you look at the short history of, of blockchain and how it's evolved, um, and, and just look at the open source stacks of, you know, R3 Corda or, you know, Hyperledger Fabric and, and Ethereum, of course. And, and, and if you just think about how much they've evolved and how much, let's face it, the technology today is probably 10 times more robust than it was even two years ago. So in 10 years, just imagine what, what this is going to be like. And... This is one of the reasons why we're so excited about it. You know, it's, it's not lost on us that this technology can completely disintermediate and change everything that we do. I don't, I don't think that's lost on us. The, the possibility is there. Is it ready to do that today? And the answer is no, for some of the reasons that we're, we're talking about. Um, you know, the depository is an example. It's a trillion dollars worth of assets that trades on any given day. A trillion. We don't lose a single penny every day because it's just very, very robust, very old, very archaic, very expensive, but it's extremely robust. And I think that the technology in 10 years will be robust enough to actually handle that you can trust the system with a trillion dollars worth of assets. Yo, prediction? Um, I think we'll know much sooner. Like, yeah, I think so uh, yeah. too. But, so, but so 10 years, I'm like, sure, I'll hedge yeah. that one out. Go <laughs> well, ahead. I think we have other risks, like uh, will, the, will the world still exist in 10 years? Or yes. will, will the internet, you know, we need the internet for this to exist. Will we still have a peaceful a global world where we're all connected on the internet? I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But I would say with technology, I mean, uh, I think it was 10 or 11 years ago that the iPhone came out. And who, I mean, who in this room has not used an iPhone in the past hour. I mean, many of you are using them right now. <laughs> so that, like, we, in just a decade, that technology has completely changed everybody from an individual level to how humanity functions and our culture and our society. 
So um, it'll be interesting to see we're already 10 years into this, and the world just kind of caught wind in the past year of everyone's finally woken up to, to mm -hmm. blockchain and to crypto. And I don't think it's going to take 10 years. We'll figure out in, I would say, two, three maximum four years whether or not this is going to be a lasting uh, technology. Yeah, I, I think I, I thought it was going to be five years and that was a year ago. So four years from now. And, and if I just look at the cadence and, and the speed at which uh, this space is evolving, um, even a lot of the, uh, the prototypes and the experiments that we've been doing, uh, you know, some we've done in partnership with uh, European institutions, other ones we've actually done with central banks. Uh, to try and explore how the overall ecosystem could shift. Um, the first thing that I would say is you can see the technology evolving at an extremely fast pace. So a lot of the issues and challenges you may have seen a few years ago, they, they, they've been fixed. They're, they're done. They, and, you know, they're continuing to move on. The whole issue around scaling, performance, interoperability, and, and the overall operability and function of that, these are you know, some of the things that as you tackle these one by one, that dream of actually taking this completely broadly becomes ever so more real. Uh, you know, and, and I don't think it'll be 10 years before that actually happens. That's one. But the second thing that I think is very, very important is the mindset of the people. If you think about um, the world as we know today and, and how many of them can actually go and, and kind of pivot the way that they think from the current construct to the new, uh, there's still a lot of socialization that needs to get out there. That there's a lot of education uh, to talk about how these function. Um, you know, getting in and out of these positions is gr is really really easy if you know what you're doing. But for you know, for a, a, a retail investor that may have just heard about this, it, it's a little bit more challenging. That I think is going to evolve, and it's going to get to a point where it's just an app you download, you set up, and away you go. And and at some point, you you will do that. But when you start to see that pivot with, with the ecosystems actually moving forward and that culture shift, that's when you're going to start to see the, the mass adoption. And once that happens, I think it'll be very, very fast. Do you see them as your competitor? A traditional exchange? Yes. No, I think uh, there'll be a merging of the two technologies. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's I what every, yeah, I think every crypto exchange is kind of hoping in the back of their head that a existing institution, institution will uh, acquire them someday. Yeah. Um, and we've seen that NAS, I, it's NYSE made, a, the New York Stock Exchange made a pretty large strategic investment, I think, in Coinbase, which mm -hmm. is probably the, is. the main player right yep. now in the uh, United States. So, uh, you know, crypto was initially founded on these anarchic, kind of anti-statist ideas yep. of we're not going to be the banks, we're not going to like, recreate this uh, institutional hierarchy within this system, and now we see the biggest players. The Coinbase is trying to basically become a bank <laughs> and a broker-dealer, and, and we see the institutions trying to become more hip to the technology and get closer to crypto and adopting a token, uh, the token economy. So uh, basically, uh, what's, what's going to happen is that those um, three-year-old young uh, global disruptors are going to those 150-year-old players in the market and say, we are here for the sale. Yeah, absolutely. What, what, uh, I, what I would love to see is, you know, my son saying, Dad, I had no idea you worked at the TMX. The stuff you have is pretty cool. And then I'm like, what are you talking about? And then he'll show me and I go, whoa, that is not the TMX that I know. It's, it's totally different, right? Because it had evolved and adapted. That's sort of, you know, where that convergence, I think, would, would come. And, uh, you know, it, it's evolution, really. If, if, you, if you don't adapt um, and the value that you don't give to the, the clients is there, then your business erodes. It, it's just basic economics 101, right? So uh, both of you, uh, suggestion for the entrepreneurs uh, sitting in the audience, why should they go and uh, do the ICO, and why should they go for the more traditional fundraise? Like Who the IPO or <laughs> IPO works or as IPO well. ICO. I mean, okay. I heard IPOs are so 2015 or whatever. It's yeah, well, that's great. Sure, I don't know sure. what <laughs> I put it for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, I, actually, I would caution people to 
step very lightly into doing an ICO. Um, you, you missed kind of your window <laughs> a, few, yeah. a, a few months back. Now, now that the world's caught notice of what's going on, there's just incredible regulatory uncertainty. So I think it's going to probably be another year or so until uh, the fog kind of lifts off and we figure out how we're going to, to uh, enable this economy to keep moving forward at, at a pretty fast clip. Um, but certainly if you have, if you, I, I wouldn't do it just now to grab money, but if you have some really great idea of how to create a token, and obviously I'm not going to hold you back from, from trying to launch that protocol or that economy. Um, but, but I think as I was talking about in my presentation, the real opportunity will be once we allow startups to, to uh, turn their equity into tokens and those tokens can be traded um, on any exchange by, by anyone that meets like whatever uh, regulatory or accreditation requirements or whatever. That'll be a huge change and uh, entrepreneurs should definitely be ready for that. Should be ready to tokenize their, their cap tables and the equity in their company. Will you be ready to trade equity tokens? We will definitely. I, I sure hope so. Will you? <laughs> uh, you know, the thing for us uh, as a, you know, I, I, yes, we're 150 years old, but I, I think I view ourselves as, as a non-traditional exchange yes. because, you know, even if you look at our history, we actually uh, tried to trade cows uh, before. Um, we trade power. Uh, we tried you energy. You can tokenize we trade the energy. cows, by the way. In yes, the exactly. Except we didn't have blockchain at the time, or we weren't I'm we sure weren't looking a at cow far, farm game <laughs> somewhere. On right now. Provenance, this is great. A yeah. uh, Alberta beef or whatever. I know it, it would have been great. Um, but but these are things that we're we're exploring, and so the non-traditional asset classes and how to actually trade them. Um, you know the the whole capital formation process, if if you will, um, the entrance criteria to actually list on exchange. Is onerous. It's you know that there there are costs there, um, you know, to actually go in and raise capital. And if you're not at that stage, it's probably not the right time to do it. When you want to scale out and, and go more global, um, you know, and, and when you talk about the market capitalization or the valuation of your company based on some metric and your business plan and, and how you want to move forward, um, these things all take get taken into account when you're looking at a, a potential listing. Um, we even hosted an, an innovation roundtable last year to really look at the startup ecosystem because we as an exchange didn't really look at the startup community. We looked at the community that was a startup three years ago and now they're trying to grow. They, they need more capital. They want to diversify their, their investor base um, and they want to go public. And, and you know, parts of their ownership, they want to liquidate and they want to get out and uh, you know, they want to raise the funds to move forward. That's how many companies are like that these days, right? Well, and, and, and if you think about it, there, okay. there are still some, but um, you know, the, some of the Funder Beam reports that, that I saw when you think about raising capital for companies yeah. and then you look at the, the listings revenue or the number of listings, they're not linear. And what, what that shows clearly is that the companies now have choice. Yep. They can actually go and yep. decide, I can take this traditional route, or I got these other, other routes that I can go yep. and, and look to raise. And so, it, you know, it, it would be foolish for us not to explore to see how we can mm. yep. capture that, yep. right? Or at so least it, service that. It goes down to the price of the capital. So exactly. Uh, exactly. the price is uh, down. Mm -hmm. in all aspects, including price of the capital. So thank you all. We're going to have uh, John and Joshua uh, here answering the uh, questions by the stage. So thank you all, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. As we have one question by Nikolai Temchuk uh, in Slido, I allow myself still to ask it. So take a few minutes, sit down. <laughs> and the question <laughs> is, as we have this app going on, I really want to get it uh, working. Many ICOs that have raised a lot of funds have not yet delivered that promised uh, basically the services and products they promised, and many will still fail to do so. How this will affect ICOs and cryptos? The floor is yours. <laughs> well, uh, uh, 
like I was saying in my presentation, I think the vast majority of ICOs haven't delivered on their uh, product or promise yet, which is honestly very unique. I mean, I, I've worked for the past eight years in seed stage financings, and, and I thought what I was seeing in those eight years at AngelList was ridiculous. Like, oh, this company's barely got a product, and how are they raising a, at a $5 million valuation just because maybe someone went to a nice school or they had a good relationship? or they've previously had some success, or, or whatever the signal was that they were able to raise that money on. And um, now what you see with, with ICOs is that there's a white paper, and then you raise $50 million, and there's really nothing else in between there. And these tokens come out, and they continue to float on the market, and the price goes up, and to some people, it's I think to most people, it's a total mystery where the price is coming from. Um, there's the only thing I think you can say rationally is that the speculation is red hot and everyone is expecting, of course, this is going to launch and there's going to be value behind this token. And so I guess the question that's being asked is when, when is that moment when the investor base wakes up and the market wakes up and sort of wakes up in a nightmare in a cold sweat and says, there's nothing here, there's no value, and everyone wants to dump their tokens? And I think we, we live in waves of that, for sure. We're going through a wave of that right now. But the prices are still uh, totally crazy uh, by any stretch of the imagination. These, these protocols that haven't even launched very easily have market capitalizations of $100 million, I would say. You, you, you still clear uh, hundreds of tokens with that, with that bar. So, so it's unknown when the market is going to stop putting up with this. Uh, I would say it can't last much. I mean, initially when this started, I would have said a year ago, I would have said, oh, give it a few months, but clearly that was wrong. So take what I say with a grain of salt, but maybe a year, uh, two years, yeah. people are going to start punishing the projects that don't uh, deliver on their... So on the market protocols. is going to react and the uh, regulator is going to react. Well, the regulators have, at least in the US, the regulators have clamped down on some ICOs that were clearly fraudulent, but there's still a huge number of ICOs that have tech teams and have a promise and have yeah. a little bit of technology and it, they just haven't delivered the final product yet. So um, that's a good question. Will the regulators come in and say, uh, return the capital to the investors? I mean, what right do they have to do that? There are so many seed stage startups all the time that fail to deliver on their promise and eat their investors' money or return uh, something less than a dollar back to their investors. But what's happening in the world and, and in the crypto world that is crucial, as Andreas Antonopoulos uh, said, this is absolutely crucial to develop the ecosystem so that first the ecosystem develops itself by burning the fingers, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, I could be up here for another hour on this one. <laughs> uh, you know, the. <laughs> The Canadian regulators are clamping down as well. Uh, even the banks are clamping down. Uh, several cases where it truly is a speculative investment, uh, and it's all about protecting the uh, the retail community or the or the investor community. Moms and pops, peoples with pensions and retirement savings, are pulling money out of their retirement savings and buying Bitcoin or Ether when it was at the market peak, and, and they've lost everything which is sad, but that has happened. Um, other, uh, other folks that didn't have a, uh, you know, a retirement savings to draw against uh, were borrowing against their credit cards because the credit card rails were used. So you think about the interest rates on those credit cards and you know, the 18%, 17% or whatever, which in their minds is calculated risk because they said, well, if I only pay 18% and I can get into this ICO that pays 10X and then I can get out, then I've made money and I've used the credit card as that capital or I borrowed the money. And of course, in a lot of cases, they were burned and they didn't get out in time. Um, these, these types of things have actually come forward to the regulatory community and they basically said, we got to shut this down. And, and I think right. the regulators are going to start to react and, and I would like to finish uh, this panel and the discussion with the words of the regulator. We approached one of the good regulators in, in, uh, in the other side of the world and they said, obviously you are welcome to our country, do your business, but remember, if you mess up, the jail is next to the airport. <laughs>
See you tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Liz. Thank you so much.